From our studios at the corner of 8th and Walton and Bensonville, Arkansas, welcome to Saturday Morning Media. We cover Walmart, Sam's Clubs, and the consumer product companies that are represented on their racks and shelves throughout the country and around the world. I'm Derek Ridenow and welcome to our show. Our focus is on the insights, trends, and best practices to help you as a supplier grow your business with the world's largest retailer. Thank you for joining us. And coming up today, we will continue our conversation with Walmart Senior Director of Merchandising, Rand Waddups, hear what he expects from suppliers during the fourth quarter, and we will discuss the latest news with our panelist, Andy Wiseman from Redwood Venture Toys. But first, the headlines. Walmart announced this week that it's parting ways with Barty, its Indian wholesale partner. After receiving necessary permissions, Walmart will assume 100% ownership of best price modern wholesale while Barty will continue to operate its retail division. In Walmart press release, Scott Price, president and CEO of Walmart Asia, stated that, quote, given the circumstances, our decision to operate independently will be beneficial to both parties, end quote. Deadly fires in Bangladesh garment factories have attracted attention internationally with a renewed call for safer working conditions for garment workers. In a recent interview with the Associated Press, Walmart Asia CEO Scott Price discussed Walmart's efforts to police its suppliers overseas, manufacturing opportunities, which include ongoing reviews of safety standards and even thermal imaging of buildings to ensure safety. Earlier this summer, retail analyst Walter Loeb complained in a Forbes.com column that his local Walmart in Pittsfield, Massachusetts was dirty, messy, and completely out of stock on many items. A minor fear ensued, and Walmart assured Loeb that his complaints had been heard and that, the Wal and that Walmart was sending a new manager to the store. Loeb recently returned to the store and reports that while the store looks a lot better, out-of-stock problems persist. Redmond & Associates, a manufacturer of ride-on toys for entertainment franchises such as Marvel and Disney, announced that it will open a manufa manufacturing plant in Rogers, Arkansas. The new operation, which will create 74 new jobs, will produce ride-on toys exclusively for Walmart. Redmond's plans are a part of Walmart's new push for sourcing domestically produced goods. Wall Street Cheat Sheet reports that with Walmart's presence in India currently in flux, China may be Walmart's next target for major growth. Walmart has already replaced its compliance team in the region and its online division has seen a huge increase in growth. The recent federal shutdown has been on everyone's mind this past week, and while the hardest hit may be federal workers and those who rely on government assistance, retailers and suppliers have their own concern. 8th and Walton's Walmart News Now blog recently noted that cutbacks in the Women, Infants, and Children Nutritional Program, also known as WIC, could adversely affect both participating stores and food manufacturers. Walmart announced that it will hold its 20th annual investment community meeting on October the 20th at 7.45 a.m. till 3.30 p.m. Central Daylight Time. The meeting will be, a, will be webcast through Walmart's corporate site. An archive version will also be available for those who miss the live stream. And finally, AdAge reports that Walmart's been reaching out to its beer suppliers. Walmart has set an aggressive plan for growing its beer sales, but realizes that it has to mend some fences with beer suppliers first. Current processes have made it difficult for suppliers to make deliveries to Walmart stores, and this is something that Walmart wants to address and correct. Later, we will continue our conversation with Walmart's Rand Waddups on his expectations of suppliers leading into Christmas. And up next, we will be joined by our panelists to discuss this week's retail news when Saturday morning meeting continues. Cameron Smith & Associates is supplier's first choice in recruiting the competitive Walmart supplier job market. We connect qualified candidates to CPG jobs in Northwest Arkansas and across the country. CSA also sources sales and marketing professionals for companies providing advertising, marketing, merchandising, and data management services to suppliers. Contact us today at csarecruiters.com. Today's show has been sponsored in part by 8th and Walton, the premier destination for Walmart supplier education. Since 2006, 8th and Walton's Buy Suppliers for Suppliers approach to education and services has helped thousands of supplier teams grow their business with Walmart. Visit 8thandWalton.com to learn more.
Welcome back to Saturday Morning Meeting. Joined now by Andy Wiseman from the Redwood, Redwood Ventures Group. Sorry, it's hard to say that this morning. <laughs> um, a couple things, a lot of things happening in the news this week. The yeah. first one is Walmart is not going to exit India. And, and with all the controversy that Walmart yeah. has had and, and the, sor the uh, sourcing requirements that the government had put on them, I think everybody really expected an announcement that Walmart was going to be exiting yeah. India just very much the same way they did Germany several years ago. Thoughts on that? Well, I thought that too. Uh, and uh, but, but when you look at this more deeply, uh, it, it, you see a very strategic play that Walmart is making here. Because looking back over the last 10 years, India's GDP has grown on average 8% year, every year. That's remarkable. Right. That's it's, they're great. outpacing That's everybody. But, but even more importantly, uh, over the next 20 years, India is poised to add 110 million new workers. Uh, to the, Not to jobs, the, to workers. Workers, people, okay. Walmart shoppers eventually. Now that 110 million uh, uh, shoppers or workers that are going to be added is more than, than the U.S., Russia, China, and Japan will add combined. And so Walmart is looking ahead mm -hmm. to understand where can we next apply save money, live better. It's clearly, it's in India. So this is a good move. Okay. And so even with all the controversy, which they yeah. seem to be kind of putting behind them because yeah. a lot of the controversy seemed to come from just the, the marriage between the Barty Group and, mm -hmm. and Walmart. It, will Walmart still continue to face struggles there with the culture? Because one of the <laughs> biggest things is the Foreign Corruption Practices yeah. Act. Well, look, and when you're number one uh, globally, you've got a big target on your back and everybody wants to pick on you and everybody wants to find controversy. And sure, there are things that Walmart needs to answer to, and they will. There's no question there. But I think governance in mm -hmm. India itself is a concern. Uh, the caste system is a concern. Uh, but, but all of that is, is kind of secondary almost, including controversy that Walmart right. might, might have to weather compared to the opportunity that they see in the future. So they'll deal with it well. And a great there. opportunity. A lot of growth uh, yeah, uh, potential there, especially now that they're kind of separated. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the next thing we wanted to move along to mm. is Walter Loeb with yeah. Forbes. Uh, mm. Been very critical of Walmart with their in-stock issues yeah. and one store in particular in his hometown. Yeah. Um, he wrote an article, or Walmart actually responded to the article he had written, mm. made some management changes. Yeah. Walter's back in the store. Not. He's better, but he's not happy about what yeah. he's seen. Is this indicative across the country, or you think this is more of an isolated incident? Well, I, I, I don't know, but it's really easy to go into my local store here and find something out of stock or a department that might be in the middle of a reset or, or, or whatever and assume that chain Y, we have a terrible problem because in, in store 100, I can't find 2% milk. Uh, yeah. it, it's really easy to make those kinds of assumptions. I think we all kind of walk into stores looking at various things and, uh, and, and we make assumptions, but look, we're, we're dealing with a, a, a chain here that's approaching 4,000 units, so uh, to make those assumptions to me isn't, isn't really fair. Um, well, yeah. I, I think it's, <clears throat> it's good for Walmart on, on a couple things here. Yeah. Um, first of all, I know that their inventories, they're trying to get their inventories lean. Sure. Now, when you look at their overall yeah. inventory, obviously it's a little high. We're going into the holiday. They yeah. should be high up on inventory. Right. But when you get down to the everyday nuts and bolts of it, yeah. it's really about just-in-time inventory and just-in-time shipping. Uh, yeah. And so suppliers, I mean, I'm a supplier, and I know that my weeks of supply are very low. Yeah. They expect it to be at the D.C., cross side, get to the store, yeah. and be ready to go for that and sell through, hopefully be almost out of stock by the time yeah. the next order gets there. So you get the pressures on that from suppliers. And I know one thing that Walmart has continued to struggle with yeah. has been must arrive by dates and fill rates. Not that Walmart's struggling, but suppliers are struggling <laughs> yeah. um, because the volume is so high. Yeah. And so when a supplier doesn't meet that, that has to trickle down and result in out of stock at stores. And I think, yeah. to your point, Walter is being a little narrow focused yeah. here. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not giving Walmart a pass here because sure. I think there are some <coughs> out of stock opportunities yeah. that they've had. They've had some issues with GRS. I think those are getting resolved. Um, but I still think that he's looking at this well, kind of short side. Well, sure. And you know what? Jim Roy, the biggest driver in Jim Roy is, is turns. Inventory turnover is very important to Walmart. It's very important to us as suppliers. Right. So collaborating chain-wide to find solutions that drive turns is very important, absolutely. But to assume that one store uh, is, is indicative of, of chain-wide issues is, is short-sighted. Absolutely. 
So yeah. I, I think that we will see Walmart's yeah. in-stock turnaround. Uh, GRS is up and running a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that I've experienced some pretty bad Alice talks early yeah. in the spring. Those have been corrected, and so they're moving forward. And I, yeah. I would look that by this time next year, the inventory issue is not so much with Walmart. I may be wrong, yeah. but that's going to be kind of my forecast There's here. So it. hopefully Walter will see his storage yeah. get a little bit better. And Agreed. We'll use up on that. Uh, the final topic I want to come back and talk about is beer sales at Walmart. Now, yeah. I mean, I was at Walmart 10 years ago, and, and I know it was kind of taboo, mm -hmm. selling liquor and beer and alcohol. And firearms. And even firearms. <laughs> uh, so the ATF yeah. was, was not really welcome so much at Walmart, <laughs> and I said jokingly. But yes. Walmart now seems to be doing a reversal of that yeah. and really going mm -hmm. after those beer suppliers mm -hmm. and courting them to try to drive sales. Well, beer is a topic that, that I love to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, no, it's 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 uh, it's what many consider to be a recession-proof business, because it, it it isn't impacted greatly by the the ebb and flow of our economy. That's because uh, the economy think, goes down. You need to drink. Economy well, goes up. You want to celebrate. So goes the popular uh, logic. And and but but it is. It's it's relatively recession-proof. And I think what you're seeing is is a smart play on Walmart's behalf to to grow the kind of. Uh, a lower end beer segment to grow their share of that because it's again a, a recession proof business. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's it's been a profitable biz business for everybody. Although Walmart is being accused of selling near to cost, but they're doing this to earn share. And then at the same time, as they roll out the plan to double their business over the next three years in, right. in beer and, and, and liquor, they're actually expanding into higher end beers and craft beers, rogue beer from Oregon, which is one of my favorites and on and right. on. So, so they're making a very strategic play to grow in a category that's recession proof. It's very smart. Which can present its own series of opportunities yeah. um, because as, as you get into regionality, yeah. you get more and more of those. So from a beer supplier standpoint, really need to understand store of the community because that's going to be a Absolutely. big factor and how and where your beers are going to be placed, yeah. which is a win-win for stores because mm -hmm. the local breweries, there's a local brewery here in Northwest Arkansas. Yes. Haven't seen it in Walmart yet, yeah. but I would expect that they, they are there soon. Yeah. But it is interesting to see them kind of do reversal and really go after that. And even if they sell it at cost, and even if they use beer as a loss leader, yeah. all the other categories that they're going to pick up, because we think about what goes into the basket for the consumer buying beer. Absolutely. Continued opportunities for some of the snack suppliers. Yes. Some of the party suppliers. Yeah. Yeah, Thoughts it's, it's a win-win for everybody, really. Um, and it, it uh, who loses in this equation is is the specialty beer, the liquor stores. Who don't want to be competitive. Who don't want to be competitive. So Walmart will bring competitiveness to both the craft beer side uh, because of uh, the ease of finding it at Walmart when I'm there shopping for other things anyways. And they'll bring price to bear against the more commodity branded uh, beers as well. So the, in the end, shoppers will win. The consumer will win because of this. Yeah. Okay. We look forward to seeing what happens. Yeah, Andy, as too. always, thank you very thank much. You. And we'll stick around because when we come back, we're going to talk with Rand Wattups from Walmart. He is a senior merchandising manager in electronics. We will find out what his expectations are for suppliers as we get into the Christmas season. The Saturday morning meeting continues. GigWalk is an on-demand mobile workforce that can collect data and do work at retail. Businesses use GigWalk for retail audits, merchandising, and much more. With 350,000 smartphone-enabled workers available on-demand, you get unprecedented speed and coverage across the U.S., Canada, and the U.K. And all work is reviewed for quality and accuracy. Visit GigWalk.com to learn more. Today's show has been sponsored in part by 8th and Walton, the premier destination for Walmart supplier education. 8th and Walton offers a variety of services including new supplier onboarding, scorecard optimization, and analysis and reporting. Visit 8thandwalton.com forward slash services to learn more. Last week, we had a chance to sit down with Rand Wattups, the Senior Merchandising Director in Electronics for Walmart, to find out what suppliers need to think about with innovation. This week, we had a chance to continue that conversation and look forward to what he expects from suppliers this Christmas. So what do you want to see from suppliers? And, and as we get into the back half, you got three months now until Christmas, which mm -hmm. is obviously going to be very, very big for you, uh, not just Walmart, but your area in particular. What are some things that you want to see from suppliers in the next three months? And I, I realize most of your planning is probably already done, but what do you want to see? What are you expecting? And so, not, not lo looking at earnings, I mean, I don't want you to go yeah. off, but what are you wanting to see from suppliers? So there's, there's two things. One, we have to remember that from a line review standpoint, 
when we go into the holidays, we actually are finalizing next year. So it's really easy to do one of two things. Either forget about Christmas because you're so focused on next year that you, you, to some extent, kind of play the I'm a victim of my current status and I'll fix it next year, and that's right. not okay. Or we get so into Christmas that we forget about the line review and we don't put the time and effort we need to to be able to make sure that next year is outstanding. And so there's a balance there. And what I need, what I talk to my suppliers about right now is making sure that we are managing that balance well, that we are focused on today as much as possible because we have to capture every single sale we can today. We have to be smart about every in-stock point we can get in the positive. We have to be smart about every price point that we can go optimize. We have to be smart about using our trade funds incredibly or, or whatever buckets you've got for funding incredibly well against promotional opportunities and marketing for holidays, but also really strong pricing and rollbacks obviously there. Uh, but at the same time, we got to be thinking about, okay, as we start in the line review process and we're, we're thinking about where we're going to be you know, come next year, we can't miss that, the incredible importance of of bringing the right items. Uh, one of the most important things that a supplier does, uh, almost above everything else that they do, especially a salesperson on the supply team, right. is, is being the, the aggregator and selector of all the things that that buyer could see. And if you're not aligned with your merchant or your buyer before you go into a line review because you've been too busy focused on other things, right. and you go in there and just throw mud at the wall, not much is gonna stick. But if you've gone in and spent a little bit of time beforehand and managed to, to discuss with that merchant even for 10 minutes about their strategy, about where they're headed, our annual operating plan, planning is basically done now. Um, and so you, our merchants can tell you what they're doing and what they're going to focus on next year. Okay. And now's the time for you to be able to make sure you have that conversation so you can have an early read and feel really comfortable and confident that you go in with the right items, with the right story that is what we're looking to go do at, a, at an individual merchant level. So as you're looking at that, what do you, what's, are you particularly looking at more? Are you looking at, at higher market share? Are you looking at better cost? What are some, some key yes. things that you're looking at? If you could add but, anything to that list, I'd say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is obvious. I mean, it's kind of a, a no-brainer. But as you're looking at, at growing, and you've got not so much regional brands with the uh, with in electronics, but as you get outside your department and into mm -hmm. some of the other departments, so you have regional brands, what are some things that those suppliers need to understand? Obviously, they need to innovate, and you've given them three things that they can go and look at innovating. But what's more important for them? Coming in with a better cost. I mean, obviously, Walmart makes more money on regional brands, mm -hmm. but is cost the factor or is market share the factor? Yeah. I mean, you were in food for a while, which is why I'm asking this question. Yeah, and, and from my experience in food and from my experience in electronics, it, it's always a balance, right? Y you've you've got to go play a, a value play. However, at Walmart, we will win on price. Which is the big factor. I've got a meeting coming with my buyer here in a couple of weeks, and I know that's already the communication is we will win on price. We will win on price. And what that means is not just that we will, we don't want you to come in and have a discussion with us that says, you know, whatever you guys come to me with, I'll just deliver this price. We want you to have a discussion that says, okay, here's the price I can deliver. Here's all of the detail around how I get to that price. Here's okay. the other buckets of funding that we've got to go spend somewhere. And here's the opportunity for us to go have a discussion as a, as a partnership around other costs that, are, that may raise your cost to serve in some way. And so the, uh, the, the key point that we're working on on my team right now is mm -hmm. we have, because of the way my business functions, which is very different than food and consumables, we have return authorizations where we will, right. we will bring product in and then we'll, because of, say, it's, uh, we'll move to a new iPad or something, right? The iPad changes size and dimensions, and so we're going to need to get out of the old cases. Right. And so those cases will have to be removed and deleted, but we, we have our suppliers go pick those up and take them back. And if we are not efficient with what we have in the stores for that take back, our cost to serve model goes substantially higher for that supplier. And so we've got to be focused on those returns as much as anything else to make sure that our costs to serve is as low as it possibly can. And then having the partnership around where all the buckets of funding are, what the price is that you bring, and, and then opening up the cost to serve as, a, as all key discussion points is, is really essential to our success in driving EDLP. So what are some mistakes you've seen suppliers make? In, in all of the departments you've been in, because I know yeah. you were in DSD, I know you were in grocery and now electronics, what are some of the big mistakes you've seen suppliers uh, just completely? Two most it? common mistakes I see. 
The first one is that salespeople believe it's their job to sell. What their real job is to go is to go work internally within their organization to help their buyer be an advocate together for the customer. Because if that's their job, they'll sell more than any other person in their, in their sales team. But if they go in and think that my job is to sell this buyer to get them to buy more, instead of my job is to go in and figure out how we will further our partnership to be an advocate for the customer, then you lose opportunities. And there are a lot of opportunities when you go in and advocate for the customer with your buyer. Mm -hmm. um, the second most common mistake I see with, with the supply chain is, um, with the, excuse me, with, with suppliers as they come in and, and, and work with me and my buyers is, I see a lack of balance. And um, most of that, in my, in my opinion, comes from not really thinking about the higher level opportunities um, missing simple things like I focus so much on in stock I forgot about the fact that I could get overstocked right um, or I focus so much Which on in a highly innovative category goes back to what we just talked about those return authorizations exactly um, or I focus so much on on having the right person in this role that I have a horrible person in this role and it, it creating and maintaining the balance with your with your talent that, is, that are dedicated to the Walmart business um, with your, with your mind share, with what you think strategically is important, and of obviously with the functions, the fundamentals of being a steward of this business mm -hmm. are something that, that are difficult to do, but it's something you, you've got to keep all the balls in the air. And as my father-in-law says it best, he said, you know, he says to people all the time, you can, you can juggle as many balls as you want, you just can't drop the glass ones. And so you and your business, every supplier needs to identify their glass balls and make sure they're not dropping them. So what are your expectations from suppliers? My expectations? Yeah. Simple. Grow your sales. Grow your profit. Make sure you're managing inventory well so that it's growing at half the rate of sales. 98 plus percent in stock. 90 plus percent fill rate and MBD compliance. It's, it's all the things that come right it's off on the, the supplier scorecard. Score um, what would you tell smaller suppliers? I mean, obviously electronics is kind of dominated by some very big ones, but uh, I'm sure you've, you're seeing some outsourcing with the, the innovative price point. But what are you going to tell small suppliers when they come in to meet with you or before they come in to meet with you? What should they know? Small suppliers need to understand that, that they need to come with something that makes them unique, and that will grow, grow their business. So LifeProof was a non-existent supplier of, of cell phone cases. And they came along with something truly innovative, waterproofness. I can waterproof a phone. And the concept by itself is, is innovative and, and in its design and in its concept. And of course, now they're the number two in, in uh, most outlets for cases. Uh, but it was driven, and they were tiny when they started, right? But it was driven by one simple idea and a very targeted, very clear focus on what they wanted to be. And most, most of the sm small suppliers I work with tend to lack that focus, lack that, that uh, ability to say, we're going to stand for this and we're going to deliver that for you. And this could be price, this could be innovation, this could be whatever, but we've got to continue to, to, to push our supply chain and our, and our supply base generally, especially our small suppliers to be those creators of innovation because they're nimble and because they're, they're good thinkers, but they have to f stay focused to get there. Okay, thanks. One last question. What keeps you up at night? Oh, wow. That's a good question. <laughs> um, today, what keeps me up at night is, um, to, to the earlier question around what do I, what I care about, and it's the supplier scorecard metrics, mm -hmm. those boil down to soft skills and competencies on both ends of the spectrum. My buyers um, and, and me, myself, and my team, we have to have stronger competencies to be able to do what we need to do for our customers, and we need the same thing of our suppliers. We have to raise the bar on our own expectations of ourselves and of them, and, okay. and as all part of that, that partnership level, that ability to really communicate and be open with one another, that is what's keeping me awake, is I feel like we're not as open with one another as we need to be to be able to get to that new competency.
Okay. Well, thank you very much. Unless you want to tell us what's going to be on Black Friday. Uh, yeah, we're going to have. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rand, thank you very much. And thank you for taking the time to join us. If you have questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. Our address is Saturday at EthanWalton.com. And don't miss next week's show when our featured guest will be Colby Beeland from K Stack, and we'll be talking about logistics and freight consolidation. That's all coming up on next Saturday morning.